Text me and I'll text you back. Text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. Tip top, you don't stop. I will help you make your paper stack. Where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Where you at now? Two four five nine six four five two four three nine. You know. Two zero five nine six four five two four three nine. You know. Good evening, afternoon. Um, <laughs> welcome to today's daily live topic for today is um, how to calculate your assignment fee for wholesaling houses. All right. Now, um, I've never. Well, I'll get into that later, but that's the topic. We'll get to it. So we're here to talk about real estate investing with a strong emphasis on wholesaling real estate, which is a low barrier to entry into real estate investing where your cash or credit really really doesn't matter it's all about learning the process the technique and using that to to make money it's a great way to just use a technique to make money with no money so we're here to talk about that to answer your questions we have uh miss kelly uh here in the uh, huntsville area uh she's here she's a real estate agent bro i'm sorry broker i'm sorry I'm, broker now so um she's here to lend she's an investor first and broker yeah. i guess you yeah. know it's just a tool that she used to accomplish yes. her daily mission how's it going kelly i'm doing great how you doing today oh super tight super tight so um she's going to lend her expert expertise on on the biz so uh before we get started uh, if you want to join us on the live to get uh push to the front of the line uh text the, the word gator and follow the instructions in that in that text um what else i got um want to partner with me five zero five zero text those numbers to this number and that video will explain how that works as for this is for houses um Mini storage, public and uh, mini storage and self storage takes the word units. And we'll get to some other stuff. Oh, um, I will do this. Go ahead and do this. If you want the uh, free training, uh, you got prop training, you sign up through digulator.com. You want us to train you on how we use it on a daily basis for free, text the word time. This is only just for the, the use of that particular tool. All right. And if you want to access the tool, guess what you need to do? Text the word too. That's brilliant. Some brilliant stuff, ain't it? So, <laughs> so enough of that. We will have more of those coming, but I just want to get those few in, out of the way. And um, do we have any questions yet? Yeah, we got a few. Um, so everyone is saying hello. What's up, flipping ladies? Hello, flip family. Hello. Um, let's see. This one came from Instagram. They said, at what point do you reveal the address of the home to the buyers? Is it when they are ready to see the house? <laughs> well, you need to have it under contract first. Um, you don't want to put that out there unless you just really have a strong relationship with a buyer. So one you've probably done a number of deals with, you know, they won't circumvent or try to take your deal because you don't have it under contract sometimes. That's uh, an advantage of having a strong relationship with the buyer because sometimes you can negotiate it on based on what they're probably willing to pay on a buyer or two if you have that type of relationship. So relationship, but normally you don't give out that information unless you have uh, it on the contract. You know, some people uh, ask that question common, and it just think about it: How can they evaluate the property without their address? Can you? No, you can't. So how will they be able to, to evaluate it? You know, it's just really simple. They can't evaluate the property um, seeing it, to see if there's an opportunity for them without having access to the actual address or that information. Your thoughts, Miss Mead? Yeah, I agree. Um, and that's honestly, I was just thinking about in the real, like in the license world and in the wholesaler world, when I first got started as a wholesaler, um, when I didn't have those relationships, I would do the same thing. But just think about why why we why we do that is because you probably hadn't like comped it out, or you would you were unsure 
Um, so if you have those insecurities, those are uncertainties, like you should definitely JV with someone that's more experienced, um, that you can guys team up on a couple of deals until you can do some things on your own. Um, but otherwise definitely get it under contract. And even if you are, um, even if you feel even more like, um, you know, just kind of afraid about giving out the information, you can always file that contract at your local courthouse and like it, all of that will be on record. So if anybody goes around you, if the seller goes around you and, and cuts you out the deal, you at least have something um, on the record that says that you had equitable interest in that particular property. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. Yeah, that's what I turned on so she could hear. Okay. Um, so this one came from TikTok. It said text messaging or cold calling to get started. Your thoughts, Kelly. Um, I personally do cold calling. Uh, it, only reason why I I don't do text cold text messaging, uh, mainly because the regulations are changing all the time. Um, and I mean, you can go through a service that keep that keeps up with those regulations, but for me, um, cold calling seems to be a little bit just more streamlined. Um, and you know, you run through everything, and if anything hits the uh, DNC, um, it's, it's scrubbed. So for me personally, I prefer cold calling. Um, but both of them work. It's just that for me, text messaging just seems the regulations just change too much to do cold texting. A uh, very valid point. Um, well, I'm, a, I'm affiliated with um, uh, and a reseller of batch leads, and you know they they have the staff you know, and the legal team on hand to stay on top of that stuff. So she, as she mentioned, um, you can use a service that stays on top of it. Now, of course, both work. Um, just from doing both of them on a uh, mass level uh, on a daily basis. Um, the response rate um, is going to be, um, in most cases, uh, better with text messages because you're just going to get a lot more pay people to read your messages. Um, and how the numbers play out, um, it's sort of it, it, they're just different, you know, because you're going to go through quite a few calls versus only sending out maybe 150 to 250 texts because that's really all it takes, uh, whatever. So you may make depending on how many people or who you have making your calls for you, you may make a thousand or 2000 calls a day and sometimes a lot more depending on your operation. So, uh, and if you're using an automatic dial, there's no way you could just be picking up your smartphone and make that number of calls. It's just, it's just not possible. So, um, but you know, it, it just, it's just sort of hard to say, you know, sponsor rate text messages for, for certain, um, probably reaction in real time, per se, uh, with cold calling may be a little better. So it's like a trade-off with each. She mentioned scrub and explained what it is because I don't think most people understand what it is. Well, you know, people, um, a few years back, they came up with a, uh, some federal um, regulations where people didn't want to be solicited, you know, by businesses. You know, they could be added to what they call a do not call list. And so, um, that the phone number would go on to that list. So the services will scrub, I guess, on a daily basis to um, to to prevent you calling those numbers that are on the actual list or scrubbing. All right. First question on YouTube came from Daniel. He said, do you use your contract on commercial deals? Uh, no, that contract is only um he's asking do i use the contract that i give away which if you want to copy that just text the word contract to the number but uh that contract is only used for residential real estate for houses all right this one says i have a deal but i'm not close how can i lock up the deal if he doesn't have any internet Good job. you want to answer I, I, I like that question um, because honestly, that deal is probably the deal you're most likely to uh, get paid pretty well on. Um, I'm assuming that they're like, um, 
I'm, I'm assuming they are a senior citizen. Um, that's when you can really show why you are the person that you should go with and, and implement your concierge service. Um, either have someone you can, it's like, uh, do they still have TaskRabbit? Um, <laughs> but there are different services that you can send someone out there. And if you're not, if you're doing virtually or if you're nearby, you go there yourself and basically have everything ready. Um, even if it's a mobile notary, um, I would actually just contact the mobile notary, even if they're not notarizing anything and just ask them if they would go and complete this paperwork for them and turn it back into them and just pay them a fee for it, even if they didn't, never had to notarize anything. Um, but I would definitely use that as a way to implement your concierge service. And then I'll absolutely get a, a review from them after that, after you close the deal. <laughs> um, what they said over there. Um, oh, uh, okay, yeah, most definitely you're dealing with someone that um, I guess they don't do email, they're not local. Um, the old USPS still works, or you can send yeah. it FedEx yep. or UPS, you can do that also. Um, and uh, you may want to include um, a way for them to send it back very easily, right? So um normally if it's an individual that doesn't have the technology or refuse to use it then you know that that's a good option too and obviously what she said um but the old postal service or fedex or ups um could be good options also all right um we have somebody in the gator room, <laughs> gator room. um victor douglas he was on yesterday i'm about to add on Hello. What's going on? How y'all doing? Hey. Uh, I'm doing man. Uh, not much. Uh, I just, I wanted to, you know, I guess basically kind of tune in just to make sure I, I understood it right. Uh, Cause I asked a question about showing the address to the buyer. Uh, say for instance, like I said, if I'm advertising on Facebook page and on, you know, a real estate Facebook page and they, you know, they ask for the address um, or they, you know, say, you know, message me about the property. I message to them. I can, it is okay to just go ahead and, and give them the address. Well, I, I, I guess I might ask a couple of vetting questions, but I, you know, you know what I'm saying? I hate, the only reason I said this is because I hate to like just give it to everybody that, you know, wants me to send them information about the property. Then they kind of go behind my back. I don't know. I guess it's always a possibility, but I'm just saying, you know. I, I guess you could have a conversation with everyone to ask for it, you know, in some form or fashion. If it's done through uh, what Facebook Messenger or a text call. Yeah email or whatever um i guess some form of screening um at the end of the day they gotta have an address whoever whoever you're speaking with you know what i'm saying just, yeah there's no way just, just think about it for yourself how, how could you have known that you have an opportunity without the address that's the yeah. purpose that's one of the purposes of your contract yeah making sure yeah. they have to come through you yeah, no, nah, I feel you. okay. Yeah. Well, not not saying what you're uh, assuming is going to happen can happen. That's part of the business, but you know, for the most part, um, you know, that's people understand that. You know, that's not how business is done. Because even if even if they go to the seller, then the sellers would have to want to get on board with what they got going on to do it. Now that could possibly blow your deal up. And the seller not want to deal with either one of you all, but um, it, it, it's it, I don't think it happens. So it hadn't happened up like this. It hadn't happened to me that much. And most of the people that I've conversated on over the years, it hadn't. I'm trying to think of a time that it's actually happened. Um, they usually, you, you know, you're talking to them. They they usually don't try and go behind your back, at least from from your experience. Nah, man, it just. I can't know what you're saying. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> no, okay. I appreciate it. And, you know, I, I think you gave a number out. If, if you know, if we want to partner with deals in the future, you said what? What is? What's? What do you text to? Uh, yeah, you text five zero five oh, fifty fifty. Yeah, fifty. Okay. All right then. Thank you now. Uh, no problem, man. All right. All right. If you uh, go ahead. Uh, 
You want me to go ahead? No, go ahead. All right. Um, someone said they have a cash buyer who's interested, but they're gonna invite all the cash buyers just in case. How should they do that? Like, how do you show your property to cash buyers? Not all at once, please. You got it, kid. So, how do you show? Like, if you're gonna ex, they're gonna do. A, they're gonna tour the property. Is it? I guess I need a little bit more information. How do they show their cash buyers? Is this a property that I'm assuming is you schedule the time with either the tenant or the owner and they have vacated the property so that you can conduct you know inspections or to actually show the property? Can do you have a can you give me a little bit more context on how you're like what's their process of how they do showings? Okay. Well, well. Like I said, we would wouldn't we would need a little bit more information, but we can give you some next some, some scenarios. I don't personally like to let buyers show up at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. regardless of the situation. Right now, I have been forced a, a few times over the years, been doing a long time, where that may be your only opportunity to get them up there or whatever. You got multiple people interested, but ideally, um, I I don't want them to show up at the same time or whatever. That that's just me. I, so, uh, because sometimes, you know, the seller still may be living there, mm -hmm. renter may be vacant, and sometimes they're just not going to give you access without them being there. So, yeah. All right. This one came from Instagram. They said, do you need an LLC to wholesale your first deal? Oh, that was a post. Okay. Mm -hmm. What you got, Kelly? No, don't. I, I'm pretty sure I did not have mine. <laughs> Probably the first. Yeah, I know I did. Well, I had <laughs> one, but I didn't use it. So, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, definitely put money to the side when you do start doing deals to get an LLC, and then when you start buying your own property, um, create a holding company, and and then buy each property in an LLC separately for protection. But um, as you're getting started out. Um, you, you just focus on getting to your first deal and then reinvesting the money that you make to, to grow your business. It's all about growth. Um, but you absolutely don't need your... Now, if you're talking to real estate agents, I will say, if you're talking to real estate agents, um, <laughs> unless you... When you showing like... Uh, I don't know how you... Like trying to work with them. They Some real estate agents um, are going to want to know like, you know, are you a business? Do you have an entity? Who 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 are you representing? And if you're representing yourself, then they're gonna want to see some type of form of funds. Um, if you're making offers on their like on their listings, so I will say like um, have that conversation with like professionals, like real estate professionals, if you're gonna um, try to wholesale some of their you know potential listings or pocket listings. Yeah, um, um, I don't even know what the question is. What the question is. <laughs> do you need an LLC? Type? Oh, do you need an LLC? <laughs> Not to, to, yeah, to piggyback on what she was saying, uh, to start, no, uh, you don't need one. Um, now, if you have the, have the budget to, to for your marketing and an LLC, then yeah, but you, you go ahead and get it into motion. You know what I'm saying? Because by the time you probably get a deal, and play it you'll you'll have it set up and have your bank account tied to it and everything but if it's a situation where you only have money for marketing or setting up an llc go ahead and choose uh your marketing budget campaign and uh after you do your first deal then you can easily it's only you know a couple hundred bucks in most cases to set up an llc um unless you get an attorney involved or something like that but if you're doing it yourself or or whatever but uh yeah so it just depends on what your starting budget is for your business is the way i like to term it so if you have to just decide between the two choose the uh generating leads to make some money first i'm not going to kill you to do a deal in your name you know so but after that first deal you should be able to start one because again you are running an actual business and you should be wanting to operate in a business entity of some sort remember you can join us live text the word gator uh, to the number 205-964-5243. I want to add one more thing, though. If they do a double close, I would strongly suggest you figure out a way to get an LLC, like, quick, fast, because then you will suffer 
capital gains taxes. Uh, I'm not a tax professional, but if you're going to do a double close and it has that much of a spread, I would figure out how to get an LLC before you close. Okay. Um, this one says, what should you do if the seller asks for proof of funds? You can go. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the seller asks for proof of funds. You need to find some type of proof of funds. Um, you know, some of some sellers, we're in the information age. People are getting very, they're seeing the same videos and same ads to a certain extent that you're seeing. Um, so people are getting um, a lot a lot more savvy in the way that they are even doing their off-market negotiations. Um, there are several services, though, that will provide you with Don't you have one? Do you have a proof of, ser a proof of fund service? Uh, yeah. Um, if, if a seller, um, I I'll just ask you, um, if you're dealing directly with the owner, and they asked for a proof of funds. If, if it was 10 people that you talked to and they were all deals, right? How many out of that 10 you think are actually that'll motivate to sell cheap enough of what we're trying to do? How many of those you think are asked for proof of funds? Maybe one, maybe, possibly. Possibly one. <laughs> they just don't go together. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's just like, it's possible. I can win the lottery, it's possible. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but it just it's just so rare. I would whenever you're asking that question, I would immediately want to hear the numbers. Like, what's mm -hmm. the ARV? What's the price? Because normally if, if you're getting that proof of funds question and it's directly with the actual owner, it's not a deal in most cases. I'm not saying it, it's not possible, it's not a deal. Or you're dealing probably with an investor that you've contacted some kind of way, and they just know that just standard practice for them or whatever so but if it's a you know if there's anything else a real estate agent you just expect that or whatever so um but assuming it is a situation the numbers work right and they still ask you for approval funds then guess what you're gonna have to proof up um <laughs> or it is it's no different if they gave you a price that doesn't work you'll have to just walk you know so it, it's no different but, oh, I didn't tell you the good part. I'm affiliated with a service. Uh, if you go to realpof.com, R-E-A-L-P-O-F.com, um, you'll have an opportunity to get uh, some proof of funds. So. All right. Um, what size do you use for bandit signs? Okay. Um, uh, currently, well, I've been doing it for a few years now, those 18 by 24. But instead of, um, these are legend signs, instead of, uh, horizontal, instead of horizontal, uh, we, we go vertical. Now I, I got that from, a, a well, that's back from me. Um, I got, um, I got, well, allegedly got that from a student here. Um, you can put more information if you go, go vertical, right? So 18 by 24 vertical. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you think letters, uh, do you think yellow letters or postcards are still successful? Um, well, I'm, I'm gonna answer that because I did some um, additional research. Was it last night? Um, let me see what I looked up. Um, how did I look that up? Uh, percentage. Um, what's the percentage of rental properties um, properties owned by baby yeah, baby with two B's that won't work boomers um Ken where's my laptop um <laughs> Um, 50, okay. 42% of homeowners are baby boomers. That's 55, I think the 74, somewhere in there. 58% of rental properties are owned by baby boomers. That's a lot of real estate. 
I mean, the houses I'm talking about. That's a lot of real, real estate. Um, I think I, I'm going to make sure. Let me make sure. Hold on. Let me. I put in rental property. Our young audience may not know what a baby boomer is. Well, they need to be. <laughs> Some of this stuff you're going to have to Google. We ain't going to just define every word. You're going to have to just Google it. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, that's what. Anytime you hear a phrase that you don't know, <laughs> so, um, anyway. Um, uh, um, so, that's. So, my point is on the direct mail. That group of individuals read their mail for the most part. Mm -hmm. So direct mail can be a highly uh, efficient, well, I'm sorry, a highly effective way of generating leads. Only problem with that is, not saying it's a problem, it's very expensive comparably to some of the other methods, mm -hmm. right? Um, you have to, I don't care what you're doing. Be prepared to do it three to six months. Have a budget for it. Don't even start it if you don't have that much money. To, like whatever it costs you to get it started, sometimes it's less like cold calling. The initial setup may be more than what it costs you to maintain it. Same thing with text messaging. Uh, with banding signs, that fee is just going to be the fee or whatever. Every, each time you order, if you're ordering the same amount. Same thing with direct mail. That fee is going to be the fee. You know, so if you can't do it for a minimum of three months, I'm going to say six. Don't even start it because you're probably not going to get the bang that you're looking for out of it or whatever. But it can be very effective. One of the things that the owner of the company that I recommend out of St. Louis uh, said to me is that um, whenever you're not doing uh, one form of marketing, I say you got to do everything because a lot of ways to generate leads, you're always leaving money on the table because someone that'll respond to a cold call may not ever call a bandit sign or someone that calls a bandit sign may not ever respond to a cold call. And I can go on and on with the different methods. So you always are leaving money on the table when you're not doing a certain amount of money, but so much money on the table, I'll just take this amount and I'm good or whatever. But just understand when you're not doing one of these methods of, of generating leads and whatever else you can think of, it's just always money being left on the table because people respond to different methods of receiving your message um, than others. So uh, maybe just target baby boomers what? with the mail in, the mail in stuff. Well, well, you can still cold call them and text message. I'm just saying that, that direct mail is it works better from my understanding with them than you know. And then they own most of the real estate. Forget about everything else; they own most of the real estate, and so mm -hmm. and they're going to have potential issues that well let me just say they own most of the real estate so that's going to be the biggest target or whatever so your thoughts kelly yeah i mean i used to run direct mail campaigns um and very very true if you're not willing to stick with it for uh, the long haul because that's really you got to send them at least three to five pieces of mail um and you got to get, so when I would do it, I would stack my list. So I wouldn't send because it was so expensive uh, to send. It would be with multiple people, um, with multiple layers of motivation to sell. Um, and I would, I would take that. It would have to be at least three motivations, levels of motivation to sell. And I would get creative. Now, let me tell you what not to do. At one point, I, I saw something on YouTube and it was like, put an object in it, like a penny. Because you know you get those march of dimes and stuff like that. Don't do that because <laughs> unless you have a good way of doing it, or you tape it to the you tape it to it. Because I got a lot of return mail because it had been open. <laughs> um, I've known people to do like the like the um, like the bubble, like it looks like a package, like a letter package. Um, it'll be like heavy stacks, which can get really expensive. But it'll be just a lot of paperwork of, of their business and the con, you know, uh, and um, like potential offers. So get creative with it, but definitely stack it if you do so that you will know that this stack of people of leads that you send out as direct mails have a higher potential to convert because they have at least more than one level of motivation to sell. All right. Um, this question came from TikTok. They said um what's been your best way to gather leads is a tax delinquency list um for you a good way um 
Well, it just goes in stages. Um, it, just, it just goes in stages. Um, cause the leads are just different depending on how they're coming in, whether it's um, the, the things that we're doing is Facebook, Google AdWords, banner sign, cold calling, text messaging, and sometimes direct mail. That's what I'm talking about because we, we're not consistent with it. So it's almost like you're just throwing money down the, the drain or whatever. Um, probably just right now, uh, the cold calling is working best as far as the number of leads that are being generated. Um, just, you know, right now. So, um, but about the tax delinquent leads, um, well, uh, uh, as Kelly said, that's just another list. Um, you would like to think that they may be motivated to sell because they haven't paid the taxes, but that doesn't mean, mean that, but it's just like with any other list, you got to be dedicated to it. Um, obviously that shouldn't be your only, uh, source of potential motivation. So, uh, but those work too to answer your question. All right. This one says, where can you find people to team up with? Kelly, what can you find people to team up with? Oh, man. I mean, honestly, just about everywhere. Um, I would see social media. They have so many Facebook groups. Um, you can, I would say join them and post. Um, tell people that you're looking to team up. Uh, people will respond. Um, <clears throat> local meetups. Um, there, there should be um, real estate investing, like RIAs or some sort of local meetup. You can go to meetup.com and just like literally Google it. Eventbrite also. Um, a lot of virtual events. You can meet people there virtually. Um, but I mean, it's literally anywhere um, that you are socially um this has any type of social connection you can meet someone to, to team up with all right um can you wholesale camper rv type mobile homes camper RV type. can you wholesale rvs i guess they basically are saying which that's mm -hmm. basically an automobile right right <laughs> or, or are they talking about the one that you pull you know in you can drop it. I don't know. I it don't matter. I think it still still falls in that category, doesn't it? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. just like saying you're selling a car, you know. So it's yeah. not really the same thing. Um, and those uh, depreciate like an automobile does. You know, the day you drive it off the lot, you did not you can't turn around and they'll give you the same price for it. If you like literally turn around in the parking lot, <laughs> they're not gonna give you the same <laughs> what you just paid for it once that paperwork is done so so it's a depreciating asset but you know so it's relative but you know, wholesaling it is still it's like selling a car so however that will work yeah this is kind of where that word wholesale is not as interchangeable as, as it is in like the car business as it is in real estate because in the car business they're gonna want you to pay you know you're gonna have to pay you're gonna have to have some money to get in the game um, and then you can flip it for a, and sell it for a higher dollar amount. But it's not like where you write a contract and you assign a contract to someone like that. That's not the same. It's more of a what, car flip. All right. This one came from Chantel. Um, they said, hey, there, flip man. I have an opportunity to get two or three properties for fairly cheap, but they are in a low flying flood zone, low lying flood zone. And were flooded during hurricane either down here in New Orleans. Do you think it would be worthwhile to deal with from a wholesaling standpoint? Don't you direct that directly at me? Um, I would. I, I, Seems like flood zones are probably really common down there. I would think. I don't know this. Uh, I would think, uh, being in that is below sea level, right? Um, I, I know they had a levers and all that stuff, but anyway, um, I guess what I would want to know is in that particular area, that neighborhood is just if if I didn't know anything about the flooding, if I drove through there, are there just a few vacant houses, or every other house is vacant? You know. So 
I, I don't know. How, I, I would need more information. I don't know how to answer that. Um, what, what, what do you think, um, uh, Kelly? Yeah, as, as soon as she asked that question, I, 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 my first thing is, what is the market doing there? Like, is it have multiple houses been sold in that area or that street? Um, you know, it's just the same as as you're evaluating flood zones. I mean, the biggest thing, I'm not sure what the insurance is like there um, in Louisiana in the flood zones um, for flood insurance, but I, I would I would just evaluate it like I do anything else and then just add that in if someone, if you're going to wholesale it and you're going to run the numbers, I'll just add that cost in um, because if people are buying in New Orleans, they probably are already like they understand what areas they want to buy in as far as, and they're probably okay with a certain level of flood zone risk um, is my, my guesstimate, but I would just, I would see what the market is doing and then um, figure out if this is probably a good opportunity for you to talk to some, uh, some um, homeowners insurance agents to see what the homeowners insurance, what the flood insurance is like on those particular properties. And then they could probably do some deals if they have any more people that want to sell houses. <laughs> All right, this one came from Instagram. We kind of talked about this earlier, but they said, thanks to Flip, I moved to DC. Um, how important is networking at these real estate events for new wholesalers? Kelly? I'm a networker. I run my mouth probably too much. Uh, <laughs> when I'm in the room, when I know that I'm going to an event, I have a goal. Um, and I'm going to just, I'm, a, I'm the person that's going to walk up and start talking to you. So it's super important because you never know who you're going to meet. Um, you never know who, um, even, even if it's not, even if it's not right away, like you never know who, who you met, you know, several months down the line that, that wants to do business with you because they remembered you from that, that, uh, that meetup. So it's super important. I would say go in with the goal in mind of who you want to talk to, what you want to talk to them about. But make it authentic, um, make it genuine, and follow up with people after the network event um, as well. All right. This one says, what software program would you recommend for scrubbing contacts against DNC list? Most economical way, please, and thank you. I had one on top. Um, I, had, I don't know if I put it in my notes, but... Um, you can go ahead, Kelly. Um, you know, all of the ones that I use already have that built in, like it's a part of their service. Um, so I I know that um so I use um I so my call center has one and and they 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 scrub everything for me. Um so I'm a little rusty on what's out there now, but it doesn't uh batch leads for you well well batch dollar um I, I i'm not i can't actually say yes or no on it um i'll find out and then it was um what, what is it something vault i've used that like once one time before oh so skip vault yeah skip vault. I think um, they will. good question i'll, I'll find out yeah I'm sorry, I'm rusty on that. Like I said, my my call center, they I make them responsible for that. So if anybody well, is like, I was about to say, I just make them responsible for it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This one came from Malcolm Jamal on YouTube. He said, Hey Flip, I have my first contract. If all goes well, Friday should be able to close. Congratulations. Yes, sir. Make it happen, man. Let us it know. All will go well. Oh yeah. Man, I know that's right. <laughs> Um, let's see. This one says, How do contracts work with sellers that are in the pre foreclosure stage? Gotta move fast, <laughs> you gotta move fast. With and I talked to three, two people today with pre foreclosure, and the reason why they're there is because they don't, they're not moving fast, they're not acting fast enough. Um, so how do contracts work with? Sellers that are in foreclosure, they work the same, um, but you're going to have more of a, it, it's important if you're going to do like a, if you're going to just pay out the mortgage or if you're going to do like creative finance and do a sub two, 
then you would have to catch them up. So there's different type of contracts for creative finance and cash offers. Um, but the biggest thing on pre foreclosures is you can't drag their feet, your feet, because the sellers absolutely will drag their feet. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the thing with pre foreclosures, um, uh, I guess we can somewhat define that. I will define that. Um, is that uh, someone buys a house using uh, some form of financing from a bank or mortgage company, whatever. All right, so they owe them money, so they make it a monthly mortgage payment, you know, house notice, we say. All right, so when you get behind on that, at some point, um, if you continue not to pay them, they're going to start the foreclosure process to take back that asset so they could possibly take back the house, recoup some of their money. Right. And so now you're in a pre, but there's a process to it. They just can't show up and say, well, you ain't paying us. You, you out of here. No, it's a process, a legal process. So that's the pre foreclosure process when they've actually started the foreclosure process. So we call it pre foreclosure. So why is there an opportunity there is because ideally someone should be motivated to sell a piece of real estate cheap. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They should be motivated to sell. It doesn't mean they want to sell it cheap, but we would assume they would want to do whatever it takes to get out of that situation. Now, the only reason foreclosures end, but well, not the only reason, but one of the main reasons that foreclosures end up being an actual foreclosure is because a lot of people either have just given up, don't care, don't want to fool with it anymore, or a lot of people just wait too long because they think money is going to fall out of the sky or whatever however they believe and it doesn't happen and so <laughs> and so because they're being reached out by uh, tons of people trying to get them to do something with them now if it's a pre foreclosure and then we're in the equity business if there's a pre foreclosure in the arv meaning what the house will appraise for an extra condition if it's worth worth three hundred thousand dollars and they only owe 70 that's a lot of equity. That's two hundred and thirty thousand dollars in equity. That's the difference between three hundred thousand and seventy thousand. So you have a lot to play with, and there may be an opportunity. Even if they said they wanted one fifty, meaning they'll pay off the loan at seven and put the difference of eighty thousand in their pocket, there still be hundred and fifty thousand dollars there to play with, depending on the con condition that you could possibly wholesale. But let's flip that. It's worth three hundred, but they owe two eighty. There's nothing there. There's only twenty thousand dollars equity there. As far as a wholesale deal, there's no opportunity there. So that's where you get into what they call a short sale process, and that's where the the, the person the the owner goes back to the bank and asks them for a discount because they can't afford to pay it anymore. Can they try to sell it because it, and will they discount it to try to sell it faster? That's where the short sale comes in. So the lender takes you through a process that could easily take three months to four months just to give you a decision on, well, if they go through the process, they've decided to do it for the most part, to come back with a, a dis the discounted amount that they would give you off that 280. So you may wait those three months, four months, and they come back and say, yeah, we're discounted. We're discounted down to 265. That's not a discount. <laughs> That's not a discount. So some people play that game and are highly successful at it, right? They'll have so many pre closures going through that enough of them will hit, even though most of them don't, that it's worth their while to just, just run that, uh, run their operation around that. All right, now, but they could easily come back and say, you, you owe 280, yeah, we'll accept 170. Okay, okay, now we have some. You know, again, depending on the condition of the property and assuming the uh, seller will let you have it at 170. So that's what a pre foreclosure thing is with us. We don't really pursue them. If it comes our way through our just normal marketing, then so be it. If the equity is there, boom. If not, I, I normally don't. I normally don't go any further than that. You can always do subject twos and all that stuff, but I'm just talking in terms of wholesaling. If the if the equity is not already there and they're not willing to give it up, uh, I'm generally not 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 going to fool with it. That they're just me now. Again, some people make a lot of money just targeting pre foreclosures or whatever. So, all right. So we got two from TikTok. Um, the first one says, 
how do, or what do you use to generate leads? And the second question is, um, what's the buy formula for a multifamily home? What was the first question? What do you use to generate leads? What What do we use to do what? Generate leads. We, we answered that already, didn't we? That part. Um, I guess <coughs> they asked what was the best way of dealing with it. We saw it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, the second question is what's the back formula for a multifamily home? The floor, Kelly. Oh, I, I feel like I want to give this one to you. I feel like you're gonna have the uh, the the best answer <laughs> for it. <laughs> when they they say a multi-family property, yeah. What's the well? How many units are we talking about? Mm -hmm. um, that factors in uh, five units or more are considered commercial. Anything below that is still residential. So the first thing you'll do if it's four units, two to four units. You see if any other properties have sold a similar type, you know, with within you know within that area of any decent distance. Normally, with those, you make them go a little further than you would normally with houses um, or whatever. So, assuming that's not the case, it's an it's 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 not normal. A fourplex in that area is not normal. So now it's just going to be it's going to boil down to the income it's producing, right? What are the expenses annually, meaning per year? Um, and subtract those from it. You come up with uh, NOI. You come up with a cap rate, and the cap rate is based on the um, the, in, the uh, price divided into the NOI. Uh, so, what is the cap rate? I know all over the place. So that's the capital short for capitalization rate. So it's basically like what the what would be the return on my money over the course of a we'll just say a year, right? So now, what is an attractive number? And what's not? And that's going to depend on you and it's going to depend on the area. You can call around and that's when the networking with uh, agents and brokers may come into play to see what a retail cap rate is in that area. Um, and some people would do it cash on cash return. We can get we can get go just on and on with this stuff. But with me, what I'm going to look at, if I'm just going to evaluate something like that, um, four units, how much are they renting for, condition, what are the expenses? Which expenses normally not going to be that much. What utilities are uh, they responsible for? The, the taxes and insurance is part of the expense, but I want to know what the taxes and insurance are on that small small building. And then from there, I'm going to base it on, well, how much do you want? Well, you still have to take in the condition of the property. Assuming that it's all filled, you're still taking the condition of the property. Uh, how are they heated and cooled? Um, uh, the age of the roof. All of that are factor in. So from that point, once I have those numbers, now I'm going to see, well, are are they collecting that market rent, meaning what the market can bear for two one or one one? Well, you need to know your unit mix in them, but your two one, one one, three two, whatever the unit mix is there. And if 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 I do the numbers and it's over 10%, I'm number one, I'm gonna take a harder look at it. And from there, depending on the area of town, 10% may be uh, the norm. So now you got to go to the next level, maybe 15%. And cause that's, if I'm talking in terms of wholesaling, now I'm trying to make it attractive for someone where it could obviously cash flow with the purchase. If any renovations are needed, obviously my fee and them actually cash flowing on the property. And I, I try to keep people above 10%. If I'm gonna do something in, uh, we'll just say a D area, C area, you can go down below that. Uh, well, I, at a C area, I still want to be double digits. In a B area, uh, you're definitely gonna probably be double below double D. And A, I, I've never even did one in the A area, so I don't even know. But um, it, <laughs> not an easy answer for me to give because the way I look at it, I, I don't know if I can even really explain it. Uh, Kelly, probably that's why I wanted to push it to her because the way I would look at it. <laughs> It's going to be totally just too many factors that go into it. I, I don't know if I can explain it in, in layman's terms at this point. Let me just say that. Um, no, you still it's, 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 it's easier for me to do it with larger units than the smaller units. Mm -hmm. For me, it is. I don't know why it's sort of like a, a, like a gray area there. When the larger units, it's really, really simple. But for the smaller units, it, it's, it, it's a gray area for me. 
And, and, and just to add, it's super tough because like right now in Hunt, some areas of Huntsville that are C and D areas, you get a cap rate of 7%. And I have to tell people like, that's where we are right now because everybody's anticipating everything going up. And it is, the, the rents are crazy right now. But then also one other thing you wanna, in your expenses uh, is code violations. Um, <laughs> a lot of, as, as these seniors are getting more, or aging um, and are tired of like the upkeep of the, their multi-units, um, they're getting hit with code violations and they're not usually doing a lot to take care of them. So I would say definitely check on that as well because they can kill a deal for sure. Okay. All right. Um, so the topic today is how to calculate your uh, how to calculate your assignment fee uh, <laughs> for wholesaling houses. Um, came up with that question because someone posed that question on yesterday, and I told him I would answer I would answer it here. And I've never even thought about it. Uh, uh, Kelly, do you do you have? I, I know what I came up with. Just and I probably I was doing it, didn't know I was really doing it. Do you have a way that you calculate how much you want to make on a deal? I do. Before I ask, are they seeing the same title that I'm seeing? How to calculate ASS or is it assignment? Oh, no, 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 no. You, you see, okay. uh, online, they're seeing uh, how to calculate uh, your assignment fee. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> right, right. That's why I keep laughing because I'm like, I didn't know. I didn't know if we, you know, if we were going a little bit. Let, let me make sure. <laughs> Uh, then, 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 then. real estate show or not? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We in transition. Um, yeah, it says assignment fee. It says okay. Assignment. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, I'm probably way too lenient uh, on assignment fees because I'm I'm a person I just like to deal in volume um, versus squeezing everything dry. Um. Um, but if I, I generally, I typically like to make at least 3% because that's just like what the realtor commission is. But if I see that there 3 is of what? Uh, 3% of the buyer's purchase price. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so I like to make at least 3%. Um, but I know that there are so many formulas, like some people set it at 10, 15, 7, it's just getting, I just feel like it's just getting, um, and you can find good deals where you can have at least 10,000. 10, um, I, like I said, back a couple of years ago, people were doing 15,000, 20,000. It really depends on the deal. Um, but at minimum, I like to be at 3% of the buyer's purchase price. And I make sure that the numbers make sense, that I don't feel like I'm squeezing everybody dry where it's enough room for everybody to make money. Um, so that's that's how I, I, I do my assignment fees. Um, now, I do calculate 6% for the if I do a JV. If I feel like I don't have a, a buyer and I'm going to need some help to sell it, then I will actually try to uh, try to calculate 6% so that I can give them half of my uh, assignment fee. OK. All right. Um, you make me you make me feel greedy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what I'm about to say, um, and, and uh, like I said, I was I was already doing it. Um, I mean, I'm just in text important. I'm saying, hold on, guys. All right, um, I was already already sort of doing it without knowing I was doing it. But I need to have a way that I can explain it, right? And so, um, okay, all right. Now, everybody's at different levels on this stuff, so I'm gonna try to take it from the um, the lowest as possible. All right, so um, whenever you're trying to determine if you have a deal or not is, okay, so let me start over. So how to calculate your assignment fee for wholesaling houses. All right, so whenever you're trying to calculate if you have a deal or not, you start with the ARV and, and the ARV is the after repair value you have to backdoor, you have to, if you don't know what that is, you want to do it, ARV at the number. But you have to backdoor it in order to know if you have an opportunity. What I mean by backdoor, you have to know 
how would the investor make money? And so the first thing is, is how much can he sell it for once it's been renovated? Okay, so from that point, we use a formula. It's 70% uh, times that ARV. So just to use some real easy numbers here, um, we'll say the house, we came up with an ARV of 300,000. Okay, so 300,000 times 70% is 210,000. All right, so now you have to determine repairs. Um, just a generalization. So we'll say the repairs are 40,000. So you subtract that 40,000 from the 210,000. That leaves 170,000. So that 170,000 number is what you'll actually market the property back out to a cash buyer for, right? Okay, so you say, well, where does my money come in at? So the way, if, if it's a $400,000 uh, ARV, and, and all of this stuff is negotiable, right? It's all negotiable, all negotiable, right? The numbers still have to work for everybody involved, including you. I'm thinking, well, I already know just looking at this right here, knowing the repairs are 40, $400,000 ARV, that I would probably be trying to make 30 or 40 grand on a deal like that. It just would. So how, how to come up with that number, you can do seven to 10, two, 10% 10 times the, the ARV. The ARV was 400. So if I said seven times 400,000, that's 28,000 and 10% obviously is for 40,000. So you got eight, nine, that you can use there also seven eight nine ten so that's a simple way for me to do it and not that's normally how i would do it anyway without knowing it you know i just i just really just thought about this from the time i saw that question and just started playing with some numbers and i said i just played with just different levels of it because it was a if it was a hundred thousand dollar arv i would probably try to be making 10 grand on it that's 10 percent of a hundred thousand now I would be flexible at seven, five, four, three, two, one in reality, you know, but I'm just telling you where I would probably start out at, you know, because the numbers, assuming that I've if I've negotiated it to that amount, okay, let's let, let's I'm sorry, let, let's I, I stopped the equation here. I mean the formula here. So I said four hundred thousand times seventy percent is two hundred and ten thousand minus forty thousand. That leaves one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Um. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. And so, to include my fee, if I said I want to make twenty eight thousand, we're going to use seven percent on that. If I'm going to make twenty eight thousand on it, you know, I can say thirty. I'm going to say twenty eight thousand. So, if I subtract the twenty eight thousand from the uh, two, I mean one seventy, that leaves one hundred and forty two thousand. So, what does that mean? That's what I needed under contract with the seller for or less. Now. The seller may say, I can't do 142. I'll do 165. So now I have to make a decision, right? Am I going to be comfortable with maybe five to 10,000? Probably would be, you know, if I was pretty sure, you know, um, just on the numbers. So it probably would be. But I'm always going to ask for it. When I'm trying to sell something, I'm always going to ask for more than what I'm willing to accept. I'm, I, I can come off that twenty eight thousand a lot. The debt limit is forty. I can come off of that a lot to make the deal work, especially if they talking just just fast, fast. <laughs> they may deal with their Turner Title Company. They say, "Oh, we can close this in you know this week. It's today, Monday. We'll just assume it's Monday. We can close it Friday." Okay, so, uh, yeah, I wanted forty, but you know, it, after it all said and done, my number is now twenty two. Oh yeah. Let's get it. You know what I'm saying? If, especially if it's somebody I've never dealt with before and they can close that fast, I'm going to put a premium on that itself. If, if that's normally how they do business and they close deals in four or five days, which is not the norm, I can just say that, um, then I'm going to put a premium on that. And I may take on that initial uh, deal, I may take a little haircut. So... Seven to ten percent of the ARV is is just a a number that you can use as a as a uh, a foundation 
or I guess a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a starting point on where you think you want, how much money you think you want to make on a deal. Again, it's all negotiable. Kelly says she's comfortable with three percent on what the buyer would pay. I mean, make I mean, uh, buy it for. We're, we're, we're on two different ends of the spectrum. She's more of a volume play. I like to think I am too. <laughs> but, 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 I, but it's not like I would be stuck on, on that deal I just said, ARB 40 to uh, 400,000. It's not like I would be, be stuck on 28 to 40. I would be happy with 10 if it's, it, you know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, probably for what I had to do to make that 10,000. I may have a total of I don't know even if I had a even if I had a thousand dollars invested in the whole process, which is not normal. But even if I did, you know, a thousand to make ten thousand, what they do that at? You know, just I take that deal all day. <laughs> all day, send me that deal every day. I got thousand. I got thirty of them right now. Thirty. <laughs> send me that deal every day, and it's done. Thousand for ten thousand. Thousand for ten thousand. We would do that every day. So, so anyway, so basically the formula is if you're going to use what I'm saying here, you're going to use seven to ten percent as your number times the ARV, and that that could be your fee. Again, it's all negotiable. It's going to be totally up to you. Good stuff. Anything you want to add on that? I, can't I was going to say now, if I had calculated where I can make it like thirty or forty, now I'm. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. <laughs> hey, well, you no. send me your deals. <laughs> but, 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 well, I say that, but, but you're gonna negotiate based on. Yes, I'm that, that's part of why we're talking about this because if you go to my calculator on digulated.com and you get to the part of it where it says the wholesaler's profit. Then you, if you're just going to use it based on the seven to ten percent on ARV, then you're just going to automatically plug that that number in, right? And I may change the calculator to do that and still leave an option where you can edit it or whatever. But um, so that's going to be totally up to you again. There's a lot of approach it. There's a lot of ways to approach it, but that's how I've just naturally done it. And just last night, I actually just thought about it where I could explain it in just raw numbers on how you could come up with it. Good stuff. So, um, I think said Aaron and Whitney for the Um, who? Aaron. Oh, no, that's Ken. She's going to handle it. Making sure. Um, okay. I got a lot of questions on here, so I'm just going to like randomly pick okay, some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. This one says, How many bandos is too many if you're driving for dollars looking for a market worth making offers? How many abandoned properties? Yes. How many are too many, Kelly? Um, <clears throat> how many are too many? You know, I've never been asked that question. If I drive down the street and there's a, I, I don't, I don't even know if I have a number for it uh, because it depends on what the where the street is, um, and like like if it's in an urban area or more of a suburban area, um, but. <laughs> It, I go back to where the market is. I want to know how many have sold in their area where it makes sense. But if there is more than like four or five, and I'm just giving, like, say, for instance, it's in, in an urban area where houses are closer to each other. And there's about usually usually about 10 houses a block and a third of those houses are abandoned. I'm probably like, uh, because you still want to pick the prettiest. You want to buy the ugliest house on the prettiest street still. Um, but if it's like three, if it's three out of 10, if a third of the houses are of that street is vacant, I'm probably going to wonder why I need to see some containers, some builders, somebody knocking down houses and building up stuff for me to feel more confident. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's a big thing because the, the way I also look at it, uh, you're still going to look and see how much activity is in that area. Number one, like you said. But um, it, there's different levels of that because you could be on a street where there may be four or five, but you know, the street still looks good. Everybody keeps their lawn up. Even, you know, uh, well, a lot of times you can't tell that they're vacant because the lawns are not kept up. So, um, but if everybody else is keeping their lawns up and just those four or five houses are vacant, which is a lot on a block, <clears throat> then that may be something I consider, but if it's trashy, 
You know, even the ones, the people that live there, they don't care. Cars parked out the front with a jack on there and all that crazy mess. Mama hanging out, shirts off. No. You know what I'm saying? Not with that many vacant houses on there. Not saying I wouldn't do deals in what I just explained. If every house is filled, that means a lot of activity going on in there. But if every other house vacant, you got that other layer of stuff going on. No, no, no. Because that's what your investor is going to see when they roll up. Right? Not saying that we still want some investors love that kind of stuff. Because they know they can find some really cheap real estate and they they have the wherewithal to manage those type of properties. But generally speaking, if it's just like just a it's a, a obvious number of vacant houses on the street and you got other things going on, it, it makes it tough. It, it just makes it tough. But uh, but again, the first thing is I'll probably just pull over, see pull up an address there and see how many recent sales have been in that area. If there's still a lot of sales in there. Hey, I had to let what I'm thinking go because it's just going down in this area. Mm-hmm. However, but uh, you just have to look at the numbers. It's still just going to boil down to the numbers. That doesn't scare me off. It's just normally that they don't work together. You know what I'm saying? You'll see that and it just might not be enough activity in there for the headache. All right. This one says, um, how do you like car bandit signs versus the regular ones? What? Talking about this? Mm-hmm. Like which ones do you think is better? Okay, well, well, let's just think about it. So we got these, right? You can have hundreds of those out there in intersections, catching thousands of our, our balls. Now, if you can have hundreds of cars out there, they were talking about something. And they were always in motion. They were talking about something. So just think about it. One car, one message versus messages all anywhere you want to basically put them. We're within reason. It's nothing to even talk about. It's no, it's no, it's no comparison. One band, one sound. I had the brilliant idea before I painted up the car that you all see in the TikToks, the Instagram, and all that stuff. I, I took an Uber. I, I, matter of fact, I took several of them so I could try to find somebody. And um, I had this lady, and I've, I've seen her recently like twice. I had this lady, I had and a story. um, and um, so she heard my conversation over the phone. I, I wasn't even going. Was I gonna? I was gonna ask her, but when she picked me up, I got a call, and so she heard my conversation. I was talking to somebody about a deal or something. She said, "Oh, you're in real estate." I'm like, "Yeah," you know. So she said, "What, what do you do?" As I started to try to explain to her, whatever, and um, I said, uh, "Actually, your question is right on time." She had a a, um, a, a van. Uh, I think it was a Toyota. What they call it? Um, whatever it is, um, the Toyota minivan. And so I said, well, what, what, what would you think? She, well, she let me know she would be interested in doing that, right? So I said, well, I would, I would do this with you. I said, um, what if I, uh, since you're driving around, Uber says she does it pretty much five to six days a week. And uh, I said, while you're driving around, um, allow your car to promote or let people know that, you know, you buy houses. I said, and I would take care of the uh, the uh, the graphics and everything on the rear of a car. We we're going to put in the in the rear window of the car, and uh, because when people say magnets, I'll, I'll get in that in a second. But in the rear window of the car, and she was like, "Just I'll say, yeah, it's great." I said, "I'll have a special number where you'll have access to it. So when that number is called, we know it came from your car, right? The calls are recorded, blah blah blah. All right, so she was just all with it. So." I had set up a time for her to meet at the sign, sign shop so we can measure the vehicle. And um, I think she did at least do that. She did at least do that. She met me at the sign shop where I was going to get it done. And uh, they call it window perf. And so uh, they measured or whatever. So they let me, They called me and say, Tyra, when, when you know, they, they, we never got that far. She called me a couple of, well, she texted me a couple of days later and said that uh, her husband didn't think that was a good idea, blah, blah, blah. I said, there we go with that mess. I said, man, I, I'm not interested in your wife, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So anyway, <laughs> um, so it didn't happen. So you get what I said? I said, wait a minute. I said, um, I think I generate enough money if I wanted to buy my own car and do that, I could do it, right? But my idea was to have one of my friends who needed some extra money, he wasn't interested in real estate, he was going to start driving Uber. So I was I bought the car basically for him to drive Uber. And I was just gonna drive it occasionally. And so 
Um, so we did that, put him on the insurance and everything. And so he was doing it. And he had a just had bought a brand new car. I know he's not watching this, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on to say all the whole the whole thing here. And so now I don't know if this what happened, but I just know how stuff happens, huh? Is that he stopped driving the car, right? And I know what he started driving his brand new car. You know what that means? You're gonna put a lot of miles on it. I basically gave him a car. Right. And so he was going to be able to make the money off he made on it. So just knowing that he's in a relationship, not blaming on her, but I just know how stuff goes. They like Tyrone making all that money off of you and you just getting a little Uber money. <laughs> so he stopped driving it or whatever. Was he getting deals from what's he getting? I cannot contribute a deal from that car. Oh, so he wasn't making no money. He and wasn't I've making had, no money off of you. Know, the driver had a basically a free car. A free car. Yeah. Dumb. All he had to do was put gas in. I was going to keep the tires up, the maintenance on, and everything. You're going to do it anyway, so you're going to use your car instead of using somebody else's car. Yeah. Dumb. And so, uh, basically, a free car. Yeah. Or whatever. So anyway, um, now I tell you what the car does do for me when I when I whenever I go out and look at a house. A lot of times I don't do that anymore, but my band so I got to do a lot of it. But um, when I go look at a house. It immediately breaks the ice, right? Um, they know I'm dead serious about whatever we're about to do with a house. Of course. If, it, if it does nothing else, it does that. Yeah. Now I've had people. Now I, I'm not saying the call had the car hadn't generated leads. I can't contribute a deal to it mm -hmm. outside of what happens when I pull up on from one of the other lead generation when I pull up in the car or whatever. Yeah. So, anyway. Someone on here said um, they have 50 car bandit signs being made and they're going to get them on 50 cars. Um, and then they were asking, what do you think the probability of me? Well, no, well, now, well, OK, I'm glad you said that. OK, I'm going to go in. And I'm, I forgot about that part. So they're talking about car magnets, I'm assuming. Okay. All right. See, the thing with car magnets, um, your focus, if you're going to put signage on a vehicle, on a vehicle, the rear has to be the priority. Now all cars are not designed equally and so the magnetic area in the rear may not exist on some cars where it's perfect on others but the window is always in play and you can do window perf like you know or whatever so um, that's what I would recommend because if you have a car magnet if I'm driving on the freeway at 70 miles an hour and you have a car magnet on your car I can't I, I don't have time to see it or whatever. But if, it, if you had something in the rear of your window, you're, you're forcing people to read your message. They're going to read it whether they want to or not in most cases, even in high-speed traffic or whatever. So you, you, I don't know what you got going on there, but if you're going to do it, you might want to scratch that if it's not going in the rear. It needs to go in the rear of the vehicle. Now, you can do the size if you want to, but I'm just telling you, you're going to get more exposure from the rear. Because you're forcing people to read your message pretty much at any speed. And then you can cover a larger area also. I'm glad we're talking about this. So I, you told me about that story, too, <clears throat> about the, the driving for it. So w one of the things I always said I was going to do is I was going to do that. I was going to take that idea that you had, but put it towards a Uber, Uber Eats, and also a driving for dollars team. Um, and hopefully have their own cars, but have a fleet of my own as well. But um, I think it, I think it'll, it'll be very lucrative. I think it, people have to stay out there on the road. But like you say, like if they don't want to drive that particular car, that's why I feel like you know I would probably need to have uh, like a driving for dollars team that if they needed to basically lease back the cars, if they needed transportation to do their job, they can lease the cars out and then they bring it back um you know during work or i don't know i haven't figured all that out but i know that that will work i, I feel like we just thought about how it worked <laughs> i know that, that will work because it's like a it's a driving a billboard sign i mean people are still buying billboards because they work yeah oh yeah most definitely all right this is a good question they said how do you deal with sellers that have an attitude problem oh my god <laughs> um, 
you know, <laughs> um, you can't take people. I mean, if they're distressed, um, they probably have re they probably something else in their life is probably, you know, other than their house that's making them feel like, you know, everything is going wrong in their life. And sometimes people just have an attitude problem. It's just, you know, you deal with, I, I don't know, I, I kind of mimic personality, so I don't get disrespectful, but if they are sarcastic, I'll, I'll be sarcastic back uh, with them. And sometimes it makes them feel comfortable. Um, if they feel like you're too nice, they feel like they can't connect with you. <laughs> so I don't know what the attitude problem would be. If they want to sell their house, though, they're going to talk to you. I mean, so Kelly, so you're telling me you're nice, nasty. Oh, I can very much be nice now. <laughs> you know, my thing is you, you wanted because in my call center, you wanted me to call you. You know, you wanted me to call you back. And if you got me on the line, if you're gonna be have an attitude, then we can, you know, I'm a, I know that that's how you communicate best, is what you're telling me. <laughs> yeah. I'll just turn with you. <laughs> Ow, we've been rolling. Um, Kelly, if you want to put out your uh, your handles or your social media. Yeah, yeah, you can follow me on social media on Instagram at Kales, K-E-L-S-A-L-L-W-A-Y-S on Instagram. Um, and it'll basically take you to everywhere if you want to get in contact with me. I'm going to, I have, I actually have a text number now, so I don't know it by heart. That's, that's horrible, but I will have the text number on Instagram here in just a second that you can text me. Um, and ask me any questions that you have, especially if you um, need to know how to deal with a real estate agent when doing your transaction. Oh, all right, guys. So um, what I got here, um, I think I went through all the stuff in the beginning. Oh, but yeah, I forgot to do the GD. If uh, you are uh, having trouble figuring out what a great deal, this is why most real estate investors or wholesalers fail. And then they simply never figure out what a great deal is. So text the, text the letters GD to the number. Need a driving for dollars too. Text D for D to the number. Um, what else? Uh, I think that's it. We we didn't put all this, we get all that stuff. So uh, we appreciate everyone <laughs> uh, joining us joining us today. Um, I think we got a lot of good stuff out and uh, questions answered. Uh, if you didn't get your questions answered, post them in the comment section of any of my YouTube videos. I answer those on a daily basis. This will go into replay mode on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. All at once, so you can watch this again. The best experience, I think, is on YouTube. So um, tomorrow is uh, Thursday, flipping ours. So we do that at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, 5 Mountain, and LA time four. So hopefully, this uh, particular uh, daily stream was good. Um, we really appreciate Kelly uh, sharing her expertise, a different outlook than mine which is probably better uh so uh we'll see you guys tomorrow yeah tomorrow evening uh we'll see you on the flip side bye, bye. <laughs> Text me and I'll text you back. Text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. You text me and I'll text you back. Tip top, you don't stop. I will help you make your paper stack. Where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Where you at now? 205 964 Yep, yep. 205